Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. You're watching Indigo Tech Tutorials, and if you're new here, please press that like button and subscribe to the channel. It'll help me out a ton so I can keep creating these awesome educational videos. In this video, I'm going to show you how to make an AI software as a service application, which is going to be huge. It can make you a ton of money, and it's going to be similar to the OpenAI project. So if you guys are familiar with OpenAI, that's the people who made ChatGPT. Now, when they launched ChatGPT, it was huge. Everybody was using it. Now, most people went through the web server, right? Like the GUI. And if you guys aren't really familiar with coding terms, I mean just the website. Most people went through the website to use the app, and it was very successful. But also, the developer tools were probably even more successful because they were able to license their AI model out to, I guess not license, but they were able to rent. Let's say, let's call it renting or even like purchasing as you go. So that's kind of the software as a service model. When you use OpenAI's AI model in your app, there's even a developer section of OpenAI. When you do this, they charge you per the request. So there's a certain amount of tokens that they calculate. And then there's even two models. There's the regular one and there's the mini. So mini is a lot cheaper. Optimized for speed and lower price. So see, that's pretty cool that we can that they can have a service like this, but I wanna show you guys how you can make your own service. All right, let's get started building this app. So first of all, I'm gonna open up my Ubuntu terminal because I'm using Windows, but I have a Ubuntu WSL, which is almost like a virtual machine inside of my computer. But yeah, but whatever setup you guys have, it should work fine. Now I do have Rails installed already. So I'm just going to get started and create our Rails app. I'll type in Rails new AI API <laughs> SAAS, software as a service. That's pretty long. You don't have to call it this. And then for options, we can choose if we want to have any styling options like Tailwind or even the database. Let's go Dash D Tailwind. Let's go Dash D PostgreSQL. Because if we don't do a database, it'll use SQLite. Yeah, SQLite. And SQLite stores it as a file in your storage directory, like in the code. It stores it locally, not in a database. And I feel like for an app like this, it's more sophisticated. And we would like to have a full database table that we can work with. That's why I'm doing these options. That'll be good. So I'm going to generate the app now. All right, so now that this is finished generating, we can CD into this new app. And then since I'm using Postgres, the first thing I'm gonna do is Rails DB create to create the database. And then we can just start the server with bin slash dev. <laughs> and we're using bin slash dev because I'm using the Tailwind gem and it, it uses bin slash dev instead of Rails S. But you guys are probably already familiar with that. If you've been watching my channel or just working with Rails over the past couple of years, all right, so now we have our Rails app generated. Uh, we can see the logo, which means we're ready to start developing. Now, what are we gonna do for this app? What I was thinking is we would have a website, like a little bit of some web UI, but only for the user signing up and then creating API tokens. So that would be like the first thing that we're gonna kind of develop is a user account and API tokens that they can generate. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's stop the server real quick and let's generate our user model first. So for the user model, I'm going to use a gem, Devise. I usually do this for my videos. So Devise just makes it very simple to add user accounts to Ruby on Rails apps. So I'm gonna run a bundle add Devise. I'm also gonna use Tailwind underscore Devise gem, which is something that I personally created to help me style the Devise login pages with Tailwind. We're going to do that bundle add for these two gems. And I'm going to let that run. Now we can run Rails G Devise colon install, which will set up everything for Devise. And there is a few other things that they tell you usually do, like set the root and add alerts. But we can always do this later. I guess we can real quickly add alerts. So to add alerts, we can open our code up in a code editor, code dot. And yes, I trust the authors. Then we're going to go to app views layouts and then in the application layout oh actually i'm going to get rid of this container 
This is added by the Tailwind Gem, so it's like a main class. And it just makes everything have this padding on the app, which is kind of annoying. So I'm going to get rid of main. So now our application will just look like this, which is the default app. Like the default layout that it usually will look like. Now inside of body, I'm going to render a new partial, which is going to be the layout's navbar. Just like that, we're going to render the partial, and I'm going to create the new file inside the layout's folder called underscore... Wait, I forgot, it's, a, it's not that bar. I started writing without even thinking. Yeah, that happens sometimes when you're like locked in. I was thinking about so many different things at once, but we will add a nav bar here eventually. But for right now, I'm just going to render the alerts partial inside the body. We're going to drop this code in. So if we ever do get an alert, like a notice or an alert, it'll pop up right here. It won't be styled pretty at all, but we will have it. All right, cool. So now we have device set up the next thing would be to generate the views now there is a command for device to do that but we have another command with my gem called rails g tailwind underscore device colon views which will generate all of the sign in views but styled with tailwind so that's perfect so we have sign in enabled the next thing would probably be like a dashboard so to create our dashboard why don't we just take advantage of the rails g controller command so that makes it really easy to generate a controller. And we can just go ahead and generate a dashboard controller with a show action. Just like that. And then let's start the server with bin slash dev. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my code again. And let's go to the config routes.rb. And we can set a root for our application. And I'll go ahead and uncomment this root at the bottom. And I'm going to set it to dashboard and then the show action. Just like this. And then I'm also going to delete this route. Because if we leave it, it'll have like this ugly route that we could go to. But I don't want to have that work for my app. I just want to have the route. So you go to localhost 3000 and you see the dashboard. Except for the dashboard, you're going to have to be signed in to see that. So let's go to the app controller's dashboard controller. And let's add a before action authenticate user. Which actually, we haven't added user account. So that's the last thing. Let's go back into the terminal, stop the server for a second, and let's do a Rails G device space user. So this is the last command you do for device, and you can generate a certain model with a name. So you can put whatever name you want, whatever you want to call the account that people are going to be able to log into. For us, I'm just going to do user. That's pretty standard. Let's do Rails G device user, just like that. And then we can do a Rails DB migrate which will migrate the database and now we have our device user perfect so we can restart the server and we should be good to go and test this out so we have our authenticate user action right here so if we go to localhost again and refresh we should see that oh we get the message you need to sign in before continuing and then we get redirected to this to the login page so for me i don't have an account so i'm going to go ahead and create an account Indigo tech put in my secure password and then boom i logged in and now this is what i see we're on the dashboard show but yeah cool we're already about halfway there i mean not really i don't know how far we how far in we are but now let's go to the view dashboards show so now that we're logged in as a user we can show them their dashboard so i'm going to go ahead and style a quick dashboard so I'm going to do a class on the outer div, the width full, min height screen, flex, flex call, padding top 24. So this is just some styling I like to usually do. I'll also do a BG gradient to bottom right. And we'll go from gray to a dark indigo. I have no idea how that's going to look, but probably just going to be like a dark kind of background. Reload. Oh, that's very dark. It's not bad though. So then we could put our content in the center of the page so to do that we had flex call but if i add item center it'll put everything in the center we can go ahead and make our h1 a little bit bigger and let's make the color of the text white and then we can just say your dashboard cool and then we could have that little p do the description Thank you. 
we'll say like manage your account here. Although that kind of looks like a link because there's not that much text. It's like here, so it kind of makes you think you want to click on it. So let's say this is the place where you can manage all of your account settings. So a quick description. I don't really think that's needed, but I'm just going to add it in. All right, cool. It looks pretty good. Now I'm going to add in a container where I can have like a few different settings and one of them will be to add API keys. What I'll do is I'll add a div and I'm going to give it a max width. I don't even need to do MX auto because we're already pushing the items in the center. I can give it like a P4 rounded large and then we can give it a background. It'd be like this little pop-up area and then inside of it we could have all of the different settings that we might have inside of our dashboard. But I think at the top the first thing I'll do is just have a section to manage your API keys. So let's go ahead and add in, uh, I guess let's do an H2 first. Six, five, six, 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 hundred, and we can just say like your settings. Although I guess that's kind of repetitive, your dashboard and your settings. <laughs> say account settings. I want to shove that in the center, text center. <clears throat> yeah, I think this might be a little bit too repetitive. Maybe we don't need the H2. Well, what I was going to have is I was going to have a little section for API tokens. I guess we can just put that down. Let's do an H2. Why not? Do text 4XL. Let's just say your API keys. All right. Yeah, you know what? That's not bad. Maybe I'll add some margin on this div. So it's a little bit away from the text above it. Add margin top 8. See, now there's a little bit of padding in between the text and this div. But now what I do is I will just go through like current user dot API keys dot each do. API key and I might just do like a preview and an option to copy it. The thing is right now the user doesn't have any API keys. They don't even know what API key is. So if we refresh, we will get an error. Undefined method API keys for instance of user. So we have to quickly create that model and then associate it to the user. To do that, we can go into console and generate a new model. We do a real G model API key is going to belong to user. So we can set user colon belongs to. And then it's going to have a token, which will just be string. So we just leave it like this token. Yeah, that's all we need. So we can generate the model. And we can migrate the database just like this and now we have a new api keys model we can do bin slash dev start the server again but we actually have to add one more thing into the user model to tell the user that it has an association of api keys so let's go to the models user.rb we can add that has many api keys and we can also do a dependent destroy just so that if the user account ever gets destroyed or anything, we can also delete the API keys. Now reload, and we're back. So cool, a user has API keys, but obviously they don't have any yet. So let's say I'll just print out the API key for now. I'll probably want to style this section once we actually get them. And then I might have a link to like generate a new API key. And this could just go to like API keys path or something. How about we do like a generate API keys? Just 
to do that, we would need that path to generate API keys. I don't want to do a resource API keys. Well, I guess now that wouldn't be right. <laughs> generate API keys. Let's do a post. Literally generate API keys. And this will go to a certain controller. We have API keys to uh, controller. I'm going to have a generate action. Let's go to the controller's new file. API keys controller.rb. And we can just quickly create the API keys controller class. It's going to inherit from application controller. And then we're just going to have that one create action. Or wait, I didn't do that right. It was going to be a generate action. But why don't we just do a create action? <laughs> create. Which at that point, do we even need to call it generate API keys path? It doesn't really matter. I'm not sure if I need this last. I don't think I do, but let's add it anyways. Cool, and it looks like that worked. So then with this link, we could add a little class, like if it would BG green. Oops. Generate new API key. You know what, this looks pretty good. I just want a little bit of margin around it. BR, just do a BR on either sides. Cool, so then when you click generate new API key, it should generate it, although this is thinking it's a link and it should be making a post request. So to do that, we're gonna add a turbo method. Add a data turbo method post. And this will automatically turn your link submission into a post request. This is made possible by the Ruby on Rails framework with Hotwire behind the scenes. Let's reload. We click generate API key, it will now make the request, but nothing's happening. So what we actually need to do is we need to update the page either by redirecting or just doing a turbo stream. So what I'll do is I'll add a div ID and I'll set that to the ID to API keys and I'll wrap all of our keys. And then instead of just looping through the keys, we can render a partial. Let's render like partial API key. And then collection could be, we'll just be current user dot API keys. All right, so now we need a new partial in the dashboard folder called underscore API key dot HTML to And inside of here, we can have our simple styling Maybe like around a large P2, PG Grand Soft Ledger, something like that. And then we just print out the API key. Let's do that for now. And then in the API's controller, oh, actually, we're going to generate the key first. So let's grab API key equals current user API keys dot create. And uh, every API key needs a token. So we could generate it a, a secure random token. There's actually a class called secure random. And we could give them, I think there's a few different options. You can do hex, you can do UID. Let's do a hex of 16 length, which is gonna be a pretty long token. I wonder if that's too long, maybe like 10. Well, 16 is not that long. So I think that's good, 16, that's pretty good. It seems secure. And then now that we have created the API key, let's broadcast it to the page. Or not broadcasting, it's really more like a turbo stream response. So to do that, you just say render turbo stream. And we can do turbo stream dot append, target the API keys div, and then pass in that new partial. So we need dashboard slash API key. And the local API key is set to this. Yep, that looks good to me. So then we click generate new API key. Oh, I was expecting it to work, but oh, we're just trying to display. I see. That should have worked too, but it says undefined local variable. Oh, I think I said local instead of locals. So that's a plural key right there. Let's reload. All right, so this actually is working. We can see the API key, but 
I forgot to print out the token. That's what I was wanting to print, not just the whole object. Let's do a token. Cool, so that's our API to key right there. Now what we might want to do is add some styling on this div. So right here for the API keys, we'll add a class, margin top eight, flex, flex call, max width large, gap four. Now we get something more like this, and then you could go ahead and just copy the keys. I probably want to add some sort of UI where there's like a copy button, and then the key is usually hidden. We do something like that. It's probably a good idea. So display, to display this token where like you can't fully see the information, we could come up with some logic for that. So we could take like the first zero through three. So like the first three characters, we could print those out. And then we could just take one, two, 15. This is silly. I don't even really know how to do this. So we're going to take these three characters and then I guess we can grab the last of them. Three through the rest. And I'm going to map the character and I'm just going to return an asterisk. It's like secretive. And then we can just join this. So now if we reload, we should see, we'll be able to see, oh, looks like that didn't work. Undefined method join for an instance of string. For some reason, I thought if I was selecting characters, it would return it as an array. This one probably, I guess, just returns the first three characters. This one, because I'm using map, it will actually do a, although I don't know if map will work on a string. Yeah, it doesn't, since it's returning a string. So we'd actually have to call dot charts. And I wonder if at this point it's just overcomplicated to do. I spelled chars wrong. Chars like that for the characters. Oh yeah, so now this is what we get. You know, you can see the start, but then it kind of gets hidden. I think I might have overcomplicated this. If I'm being honest. Token chars, but also like who cares? So there we have the token. That's your token. It's hidden. Uh, I'm going to wrap this, the token part, in a div. And I want to have a copy button. So why don't we do like flex gap to item center? And then at the very end, we could have the link to <clears throat> copy button, which we're going to have to add a little JavaScript stimulus controller for that. But for the icon, I'm going to go to heroicons.com. They have a lot of different free icons that we can use, and I'll find a good one for copy. So I think clipboard is usually one that people do for copying. I'm gonna drop this in. Give it a width. Boom, now we have this clipboard button. Looks pretty good. So now to set up that stimulus controller, I'm just going to go into the console and do a RailG stimulus clipboard. So I have a new clipboard controller. And that's good for the console. We can restart the server. Now we're going to go into the code. And on this whole element, I'll just add a data controller. And I'll set it to clipboard. Now we're going to need the clipboard value. So let's do clipboard value equals... I guess that's one way of doing it. Or we can just do a hidden input field. I think that's another way I've seen people do it. Input tag. Would it be like hidden field tag? API key. Set the value to API key dot token. And we can have a target data clipboard target equals Input. 
No idea if that's going to work. But now let's look up copy text to clipboard JavaScript. There's going to be a little bit of JavaScript. I think it's even using a web API. All right, or no, I guess it's not. I guess it's just, yeah, we're grabbing a text field. We're doing select and then we're doing, oh, we are setting it on the navigator clipboard. So that is an API. So let's go ahead and grab that. Go over to our JavaScript controller, clipboard controller. Oh, we also have to add the data action. So just one more thing. On the link, we're gonna add the data action. I'm gonna go to clipboard, copy, just like that. So now let's go to the clipboard controller. We're gonna need to add a few things. So first I'm gonna add a static targets. We're gonna have the input target. Then I'm gonna rename the connect method to the one that we're gonna use, which is copy. We're gonna need to pass in the event because I need to prevent default. If you saw, we were using a link on the page, but doing prevent default will prevent the link from following the path. So that's gonna be good. So it doesn't disrupt any of the page. And then inside the copy, we can drop in our code, which obviously we need the input. Instead of that, we're gonna use the target so we can get rid of that line of code. And now we just have to replace all of these copy text with this dot input target. And we should be good. We can also, oh, let's get rid of, let's, well, let's leave this here, I guess, to test it. But then we can delete the alert after because that's gonna disrupt the page. Click copy, nothing happened. It's a missing target input for clipboard controller. Oh, that's what I was thinking. I think there might have been a glitch with that hidden field. So if we look at the code that was generated, it tried to put everything inside of the value. So I think I did it wrong. I think if we go back to show, wait, <clears throat> where is it? It's on the API key partial. We have the hidden field tag. I think it's looking for two values. So like the form name and the field name. Just do like blah blah blah. Yeah. That doesn't matter. I think it's just to make the code get generated. So now if we look, yep, it looks right. It has the right target. So if we click copy, should have worked. Look, it said fail to execute because it's a hidden. It's not a text field. Oh, so actually, what we need to do is we need to do a text field tag, and then just add a class of hidden so it doesn't get displayed. And that should be a better fix. Reload. Copy. Oh, it worked. It copied the text. And then anywhere that you need to use your API token, it's now copied to the clipboard. So that's sweet. This is working very well. If we even want to add like a, a check mark or something, because we're going to get rid of that alert. So I just want to show them that it did work. Let's get rid of the alert. And... We can go ahead and add in some sort of like check icon when they do click checkboard. So for that, let's do a div at the end here. We do data clipboard target, or actually, we probably have we probably just add a couple targets here. So like on the link, we can have clipboard target. We could just say like copy button we could have another we can just have a your icons so they probably have a check in here check yep they have a check badge we can display this and then we can just add a target on it Before target equals success width and then I forget how to style this. I'm gonna try a fill fill green 500. Oh okay that looks pretty good and we can make the outline white by doing text white. Just like that. Alright and then we could just flash that after we click the clipboard. So I'm gonna start it off with a hidden class. Then let's go back to clipboard controller. Let's add our two new targets. We're going to have the copy button target and the success target. So now after we finish copying down here, we just say this.copy button, last list add hidden, this dot 
Success target. Last list. Start remove hidden. Actually, I forgot the hidden part. Or I forgot the target part on the copy button. Add that in. And we can also check if it doesn't already contain the hidden class, just in case somebody like spammed the copy button or something. I don't even know if that would be possible. Just so we don't add it more than once. So we can do this. If this dot class list uh, contains, so if it doesn't contain hidden already, we're going to run all of this code. We're going to remove the success target will now be showing. And I'm going to do a set timeout. It's going to add a delay, let's say one second, and then we can switch it back. So we can say this dot the class list remove hidden and success target dot add hidden. We can do another check for that just if we want to be really safe. But if not this success target contains it in. We're really being safe here. That looks good. Now let's see if it works real quick. So when we click copy, as you can see, it switches over to the check for a second, although it does kind of change the height of that element. So I want to probably add a fixed height. Oh, it's because this icon's 10, this one's 12. So that's kind of why. We can fix that. I think now it should work better. Yeah. Perfect. You can easily tell that you were able to copy your API key. If you want to generate a new one, just as easy as that, and now you have two API keys. I can just keep spamming. Oh, one thing I guess, there's no overflow support on this. I might want to fix that. So if we go back to show, the reason being is we have this height 60 view height. We need to change that to min height 60 view height. So it allows it to resize. Now this is better. Cool, we have all these API keys. We probably could add a button to delete them, which would be very easy since we already have, we have a route. So we have an API keys controller. We can just add a delete action. But we can do that in a second. For right now, I really want to move on to the next part. So we have the dashboard. We have the place to generate keys. Now I want to move on to using the API. And then we could probably wrap up by adding in uh, Usage and charging people for their usage and like adding in payments with Stripe and everything. Now that we've set up the API keys section of the app, we have an API key which we can use through our API and then we can also try to track usage. But right now we don't have any of that really set up. So what we need to do is we need to create the API first and then we can add the endpoint URL onto the dashboard so that the user could copy like the URL they should use for the API. Then they'll also take their API key and then they could start making requests to the API right away. So to set up that API, we can first go to the config routes and I'm going to add a namespace API. That will add a do. So we can have a block in here. Now what this is going to do, it's going to add the API namespace in the URL. So add a comment. I'll just write like API. And inside of here, we could have any of the sub routes that we want to set up for our API. So we could start off just with an API to make a chat request or a chat message, I should say. So we can add a resources chat messages and I'll set that to only create. So what this is going to end up in is going to be slash API slash chat messages, something like this. Also, usually what I see is I see people do like a V1 or V2 just so that down the line, if you ever need to make changes to the API, it won't affect the user's app. And the reason being is once somebody puts this URL into their app, uh, and they might write all their code to use this one version of the API, and then you change it, and all of their code doesn't work anymore, they would be really annoyed. 
So that's why people usually do the versions. So for that, just another namespace. You do a namespace v1 do. And now we're going to have this safer API row. So if you ever needed to do a v2 and then change things, it wouldn't affect any of our users using the v1 API. So that's pretty important. And this would be the new endpoint. So let's go ahead and set up that controller. So let's go to the controllers folder. I'm going to create a new folder API. And then inside of there, I'm going to have another folder called v1. And then we could do a new file got messages controller rb. Inside of here, we're going to need to create the class, which can be API v1 that messages controller looks like that it's going to head it from application controller and we're just going to have that create action i think we're going to want to skip the verifying the csrf token let me just look up how to do that again this is such an old answer to i think it's just this one skip before action Right here, we're going to skip that verify authenticity token before action. And then inside of the create, we could process any requests for the user. So I was thinking about doing JSON web token. I don't know if it's important to do both, but if we already have an API key, we probably wouldn't even need to do something like that because it's different. So let me just copy one of these API keys. And when I go to make the request, we would just check if it exists. So we can do a simple authorization and let's do another before action up at the top and create a before action which is going to be uh, authorize request and I'll put that down at the bottom in a private method and what we'll do is we'll check if API key dot where token is params so what would the param come in as probably just like token so if there's an api key about any then you're good i guess so if there's not if not any api keys with this token we will have to just return How do we stop? I guess you have to head. So do head 400. Now let's test this out by making a request. I'm going to use Postman. It's a pretty simple app that you can download and then you can make API requests. Uh, you do have to be signed in to use it. It's so like it's having me sign in right now. So now that I have Postman set up, I'll just go in full screen here and we can test out our API. Let me make sure I don't have anything else getting passed in right now. And then I'll change the URL to API slash V1 slash chat messages. And we can try to make a request right now. Sending it and we got 400 back. So that is good. Now if we we're going to and 200 inside of create and 400 here. I just want to make sure that it does, uh, like it doesn't cause an error or anything. So I'm gonna send a request and we did get a exception. Oh, unexpected integer literal. Whoops. I guess I wasn't supposed to have the semicolon or the colon there. All right, cool. We did get the 400. We didn't get the 200. I think filter chain halted. Cool. So this would work. So if we did get a successful request, then we could do the code, which would be using the AI model and then returning the response back. Cool. So now that we know that our API does work and the authorization well, we know that the authorization is working where it's going to return 400 if there is no API key. 
And now we just want to test out if we do have an API key. So to get our key, I don't know if I still have it copied, so I'm just going to go and copy another one. Forgot, put the email as indigo at tech.com. Okay, so let me come in here, grab one of these API keys, and then I'll go back to Postman, and I'm going to set a token value. I'm going to set a token param with the value of the token. And now I'm going to send a new request. And as you can see, we get the status of 200. So we're probably going to have another parameter here called either like body or just prompt. So we're probably going to get, we're going to send in a prompt uh, for what we want to generate or like what we want to say to the AI model. So that's what I'm going to do. And then inside of here in the API, what we should do is probably also make sure that we have the expected parameters. Let's say if params body, or like we might even want to say if params.body.nil. So if they didn't pass in a body, or actually if it's nil or empty. If they just pass in an empty string also, we want to make sure that we don't do our AI process for that. What we'll do is we'll just add 400 again. And there might be a way that we can pass back a message, or we definitely could. Let's see for now. Let's send. So we get it. Oh, that's one thing. I guess because it was a prompt, not body. Although this still should have thrown an error for the 400. But if, per, if params prompt nil or empty, let's see what this goes now. So when we send it, we still get a 200, which means it's not really working. I think it might be because we have to return, return head. Because we're in the same method, it works differently than with the before action. Okay, so then we'll go back to Postman. We'll send the request now. Okay, cool. And we get the 400 bad request. That's because we didn't put anything in the prompt. Now, if we wanted to return some JSON too, we could do render JSON, and then we could do a status 400. And the message could just be like, we must pass a prompt value with content. Now when we send it, we get the message back and we also get the 400 status. So I like that. And we could also do the same thing for the authorizing request. Instead of just heading 400, we could return a JSON with the status. Let's try that out. Except for the message it might be like, you must ask a token parameter with a valid API key. And then we could even say like, if you need you generate API key, like visit our website, and then you could actually just pass in like HTTP, for us it's just local 3000, and then depending how they're formatting it, it would be a clickable link. So let's try to turn off the token real quick and send the request and see what we get. As you can see, we get the message back, you must pass a token parameter, and then we even get a link to the website. Although when you click it inside of Postman, it tries to make a new request. Which, that might actually be a thing inside of... Yeah, for sure we should have create a user account through API. And then I wonder if we should do JSON Web Token. Probably. Probably in that case, if you're going to create a user account through the API, and then you're also going to create an API token, we'd probably do JSON Web Token. Store the user credentials. So I think this is cool. Yeah, so then if I put the token back, we can get past there. Now we just have to pass a prompt. So how about I just say like, hello world, you send, and boom, now we get status 200. So everything's working great. So now inside of the chat messages controller, when we get past here, we know we have all the params that we need. So now we just get to the point of connecting with the AI model and then responding. So in its most simplest form, what we could do is just 
use the API model right here without any models or anything. Uh, so actually the AI model I'm going to use is going to be Olama. So if you're not familiar with Olama, it's an open source host for all these different models. And it allows you to create your own AI models, train them, and share them with people. So as you can see, there's all these diff different models, like so many. The one that I usually use is Llama 3.1. So that's what I'm, I'm going to do in this video. But you do need to download it. So to download it, just go to the download page. And you have options for whatever environment you're in. So for me, I'm on Windows, but I'm using Ubuntu WSL. So I'm going to just use this install command for Ubuntu. So you can just copy that. Now let's open up a new Ubuntu terminal. Paste it in. Run it. That'll install Olama. Then once you have Olama, you can run this command. Olama run Llama 3.1. This will... If you don't have the Olama or if you don't have the Llama 3.1 model, it will install it first, but I already have it installed. So now that it is set up, we can just send any message that we want. So that's cool. And then if you guys wanted to use a different model, of course, you can go scroll through here in the models and you could choose out any of these other ones. Like some of them are better for different things. There's even a model that can uh, do AI vision so it can look at your images and tell you what's inside of it and like all this crazy stuff so there's a lot of different models and of course you can train your own too so there's documentation somewhere around here there's really good documentation for a llama but yeah i'm just going to use llama 3.1 for this video but actually i might use a couple models because for your software as a service it would be awesome if you could provide multiple models that the user could choose via like a option in the API request. But for right now, we'll just default it to Llama 3.1. So to use a Llama in a Rails app, you need to get the Olama Ruby gem. So you can find that right here, Olama AI. And it's just as simple as adding this gem to your gem file. I'm gonna come in here to the gem file, add in the Olama-AI gem, then run bundle. This will install the Olama gem. So now we're going to be able to use it. So let's restart the server. And then the example they give us is right here. So we'll just copy these bottom lines. And we don't need to require it because all of the gems in the gem file are automatically required in Rails. So all we have to do is drop this piece of code inside of the create action. Where we're going to spin up the Olama client. Which is going to use an address. This is the default address. Which is going to be running as long as you have your Olama model running over here. So we do have it. And then the result here is we're going to be generating some content and you can specify the model right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to pass in a llama, llama 3.1. Am I spelling that right? Llama. Yes, I am. Okay. So llama 3.1 prompts. We're actually going to get it from the param prompt. Let's pass it straight to the AI model. Now for the result, they give you a array. So it's kind of weird. So what you have to do is you have to take the result and map it. I have examples in my other apps. Maybe I should pull that up. But also, yeah, we don't need to. How about for now, let's just do a binding pry. That's usually how I debug. So to use a binding pry, we have to first add the gem. Bundle add private rails. And one tricky thing is it doesn't work well with bin dev. So we have to just use rails s, which means any tailwind styling is not going to work for a second. So we have to switch to bin dev if we want to start doing like UI development. But with the rails s, we'll be able to use pry, which will allow us to do this right here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to send the request in postman. Boom. Now it's going to load. It's probably going to hit the pry. Yep. Just like this. Now we can check what the result is. So as you can see, it's a whole array of, of hashes of objects. So to get, what we really want to get is just a response inside and then we want to map it all together or we want to join it all together, I guess. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say result.map and then get like a little variable that we can use. And then we're going to access the response key. And at the very end of this on the outside, of this map we can do a join and this is what we get back 
a nicely formatted string. Just a little bit of Ruby code they have to do on top. And now I'm going to exit out. We don't need to do pry anymore. So I'm just going to switch back to bin dev. And then we can go inside of the code, get rid of the pry block. And instead, we can say AI response equals this result map with a join. And all we have to do now is just render JSON. And we can pass back whatever we want to use as the key. We could do like maybe results in order to pass in the AI response. Just like that. Or we could actually pass the results array, but that's <laughs> that wouldn't really be that helpful. I would rather just get the straight text. Cool. And just like this, I think we've we have built our software as a service, basically. Although next we're gonna get into charging for tokens and everything, and maybe even tracking the web requests. All right, so let's do this on this. Let's let's do a request right now, and it should work. So I'm gonna send hello world. Test out this AI API. Oh wait, we didn't get anything. Wait, what happened? Oh look. I render JSON and then I do head of 200. So I need to get rid of the head 200 and instead do a status 200. That was definitely messing with whatever response we were getting back. So let me send a new request. Hello world. Look at this, we get the results. That's awesome. So then I can ask it anything like, hey, what's the cool uh, programming trick to impress people? See what it has to say about this. It might take a second. That's the only thing with this. I don't know how we can like, because usually with the Olama model, you can stream content. But I don't know how that would work with an API like this. We'd have to probably move it into like some sort of front end, which I'm, I'm, I actually want to do a front end for this app. That'll be a fun video. I don't know if we're going to do it all in one video, but look at this. We got the results right here. Looks good. Here's some programming tricks. We got all this different content. So yeah, just like that, we have our API working as long as you pass in a token. So now what we're going to do is, you know what, let's, let's save API key. Let's set this as a variable. API key is going to equal the API key that we find, and then make sure that we do the, the check still on the authorized request. Cool, cool. Now, inside of this code, what I want to do is I want to create a model to track the API requests. So I don't know if it's just going to be a generic API request model because we're going to have multiple APIs. Really, we're gonna have like we might have chat messages, but then we'd also might have other endpoints that we have. So what do I want to do to track this? We could have a general model like API request model, or we could just have. I mean, yeah, I guess I could do that. AI request or wait, not AI request, API request, and then we'd have to have some sort of way of knowing which type of API request it was. Uh, so it might be endpoint. We could pass in just the URL of the endpoint. We're we're probably gonna have a lot of information. That's that's one thing. We're gonna have a lot stored in this API request model. So I guess we could start off with like the request URL. So that would be wherever the request was coming from. So like, I guess that's not right. Maybe we can't do that. Maybe we can get like the IP address though. Request IP. Also, there is like this whole request data get, that gets stored in the controller. We might just want to save that whole data. We can say like request data, just type text, and then we can serialize it as an object. Uh, we also want to have the prompt. So why don't we just do uh, the params? It's also going to be, we'll just save all the params into an object. Or we can just say, like, yeah, 
this thing. It kind of is like request data might also just be the different params that we're passing in. We could save as request data. I guess I'm fine with that. And then if there was going to be like some sort of type by default, Rails has a type column already, which is for a single table inheritance, which we could use for this. We could have different models that inherit from API request, and it could be like a different type of API request. That might be a good idea. API request, request data text. All right, let's just start off with this. Oh wait. So actually, I was just writing this out, but we need to do a RailsD model. And then this is the model name. This is the method on it, request data. Oh, and I was also going to have an API key belongs to. So we can set the API key that was used to create the API request. Although, if we're just tracking an API request that doesn't need an API key, we're probably going to want to make this optional. So let's run the generator, but let's wait to migrate. And I'll go over here into the code. We'll go to DB migrate folder. Go to the latest migration for the create API request. And on this belongs to API key, I'm going to set null true so that we don't get an error if we don't set the API key. And now we can do Rails DB migrate. Just like that. And there's a few other things I want to change in the code real quick. So let's go to the models first. Let's go to API key. And we can associate that to the API request. So has many. API requests. Now on the API request, as you can see, it belongs to the API key. But I'm thinking we're going to use single table inheritance. So to do that, we're going to create another model. So we can create a new file in here and just call it chat messages API request. I think that's how you do it. And then we make a class chat messages API requests. And it's going to inherit from API request. And it basically just inherits all the other methods. So I think that's fine. Let me just quickly double check by looking up real single table inheritance. As long as there's nothing else. I think it might, it might be different once we do the associations. Do the API request. Yeah, I guess it's it's nothing crazy. Oh, but how do we associate to a user? Now that I'm thinking it about it, we forgot to add that association. But we it's fine. We can add another migration. We do a real estate migration. Add user to API requests. I'll do what user belongs to. But I guess we have an API key, so we could associate it to a user based off an API key, but. We might just want to have the direct association to make it a little bit easier. So let's add that association. And then I'm also going to edit this because it, there's a possibility that uh, we don't want to have a user required. So let's do null true. And then that's where we're going to change on the API request model right here. We have belongs to key. Oh, and we also just added belongs to user. Let me migrate the database, Rails DB migrate. As you can see, it didn't add the line to the API request model, so we have to add belongs to user. And then for both of these, we're gonna set an optional true parameter, just like that, so that we don't get a validation error. Because usually with belongs to, it requires this model to be there, to be present. So that looks good. Cool, and then on the user model, that's where we could set up the association again, has many API requests, and it also has many chat messages API requests. I think we'd say through API requests. Although that's a has many through, that's different than single table inheritance. But let me quickly, let me look at this article again. Type string. Oh, I guess you're supposed to add a type string onto the model that you're gonna use single table inheritance. So let's add that real quick. Like it's the default, but also you have to add it yourself. So let's do a Rails G, mig G migration. 
add type to API requests. Either we'll do type. I think is this supposed to be a string or what? Yeah, it's supposed to be string. So just like that. Add type to API requests. Press enter. And then let's migrate the database. Or else you migrate. So now we have that single table inheritance. It looks like okay, so it it just works just as easy as that. confused add association to model with single table inheritance rails so that's what you do foreign key wait that's has many has the foreign key of the right ID and then belongs to Creator, okay. So this was supposed to be foreign key. Single table inheritance is kind of different, but I'm just not sure where the error would come in. So th is this not gonna work? Let me try. So to try it out, I'll stop the server, go to Rails console. And do user dot last dot app messages API request. Okay. I mean, yeah, it works. And then if I check API request dot count, we have one. So that's how it is. So you have the type. It's set down here. Chat message API request is the type. Cool. So actually, it works. Basically, just how I expected. I'm gonna quickly just delete all of those. Throw it all. Perfect. So yeah, this works perfectly. So in the API, in that controller, where was it? The uh, API chat messages controller right inside of here. Now we have an API request model we can use to track the API requests. So what we'll do is, we can just go ahead. We're also gonna wanna get the AI response probably. And I didn't add a field for that. So I'll quickly do one more migration. LG migration, add AI response to API requests. And AI response is gonna be type text because there might be a lot of text. So we don't wanna just do a string. And then I'm gonna migrate the database with Rails DB migrate. Cool. All right, I'll start the server up again, but I'm still going to go back in the code and write a little bit more code. So what we're going to do is at the end here, we can say chat messages API request dot create. Pass in the AI response right here. Pass in the API key. With that API key. And of course, we could pass in the user also here. And since we have an API key, we'll just do API key user. And then for request details, request details, let me see if I can just pass like request dot to JSON. Also, I need to set up the serialization for that request details. If I want to serialize it as JSON, I don't know if I want to serialize it as JSON. So real quick, let me comment this out and do another binding pry just so I can see what the request information looks like. So to do binding pry, I have to use rels s real quick. And we're gonna make a API request. Let's just do something simple. What's going on? Send. And inside of here, we should get that binding pry. Wait, as long as, did we add a binding pry? Yeah, we did. Okay, cool. So now we're inside of the controller method and we can run any code that would be able to apply to this. So we can do request dot body. So it looks like the body was a string. If I say two string, that doesn't work. <laughs> How can I get the body? Request, we can do request dot params. So that's probably something that we want to save at least the ones that we want, like, do we really care about the controller and the action? 
we can say accept controller action. Cool. So we might want to get request params. We can just, we can just make like a request details equals request params, and then we could do a merge with any other objects, or like we could add new things. So let's see what else we want to save. Maybe request dot ip address. That might be useful. Or request dot origin. You can also just say methods to see all the methods. We might find something useful in here. So origin is a method. We can run original URL. So that's the URL that they made the request to. Cool. We might want to store that, I guess. To do that, we can say request details original URL equals well, not that explicitly, but the request dot original URL. We can set it like that. Oh, remote IP. Well, that's actually going to leak my IP if it works. Oh, it didn't work. I call it this return double colon one. Huh. Request. Check the headers. Oh, wait, let's do methods again. I want to see what else we can get. There's a lot in here. So if you wanted to get any, okay, so probably this client ID or client IP, I mean, you could store that and just see where they're making the request from. I'm pretty sure that would work. I don't know if I want to do that in this. Anyways, I was just showing you guys, there's a lot of information you can get from the request. So I think this is fine right here. Let's get rid of the binding pry. And now that we have request details, we can just feed it right into this. And now I know I don't want to use JSON. I just want to take request details and save it as an object. So I need to quickly add the serializing to the model. Let's go to the API request model and we're going to add a serialized request details. And then you have to set a coder. We're going to use, I think, JSON. Wait, I think this is right. But then I need to set the, <laughs> what we're going to encode it as. So let me look this up again, serialize rails. Pretty sure I'm doing this wrong. Yes, yeah, so this method. So you have to do a coder and then a type. That's what I was meant to do. Type is going to be object. That looks good to me. Should be all set. So now we can test that out. By making some more requests. The send a request. It worked. I forgot. Am I using I'm using Rails apps. I'm gonna switch back to BinDev, even though I'm not even doing front end styling. At least not right just yet. So you know what? I actually just realized it might be a good time to do some styling though, because there's some things that we could still add to this dashboard. So let's reload. It looks like we're still signed in. So as you can see, we have all these API keys here. We can copy it, but we don't even have a way to view like what the endpoint is. So we can quickly add that by going back to the views dashboard show. And then inside of this div right here is where we had set up this first H1. So right on top of there, I'm gonna add another section. Div class, let's give it a max width, large, with full MX auto. It's gonna be like the center div at the top. And then we're going to have the H2 uh, say like endpoint URL. And for the endpoint URL, why don't we just display it 
div p2 large. We're gonna have like this kind of like standard UI that you might see other places. And then we're gonna print out the endpoint. So for that, it's gonna be, I wonder if we have a URL method for this, we probably do. So it'd be like API v1 chat messages URL. Could just print it out if we reload. Yep, this is what it looks like. Although I think by styling, the color is too close to the color that already exists. So let's do 500. That looks a little bit better. And then I want to center that text. Let's split call and then center. We can capitalize the URL. Whoops. Of course, we're probably going to want to add documentation for all of this. Uh, endpoint request or endpoint URL. Now what I'm thinking also is like a example request that you could send. It's probably a good idea. So we could copy the same div and I'm just going to do example request. Which I guess they probably want curl. So let me go back to postman and we can take the request we have right now and convert it into curl very easily. I learned this trick. So if you go up here to the code, we can see we have all these different options and it even shows you how to do it for the different libraries. So that's sick. We can just copy this and use it. Like we can take their code and just do something. But yeah, so I'm gonna copy this and I'll show an example with curl. Although I'm using Postman. So to do that, let's drop in this just code right here. It's gonna be pretty ugly. Token, this is the URL. Uh, we can make this more user or like more not hard coded because right now it's hard coded. So let's make it less hard coded by uh, inputting this URL into here. So just in case it changes or once we go to production, of course, it, would, it wouldn't say localhost. For the token, that's probably fine, but we could also, if we could do something cool is we could get current user dot API keys dot last dot token or that one as a fallback. So if the user does have a token, we'll just print that out for them so it'll make it work right away. I could fix this typo. What's going on? So yeah, that looks cool for an example. Yeah. And of course we would want to clean up this UI. It's pretty ugly right now. Last thing we can do is add I guess let's add a div uh, flex justify between, and I'll wrap these two new divs. Hopefully they'll be on the same line now. Yeah, that's probably fine for now. So you get the endpoint URL and here's an example request. Of course, I want to move this into its own documentation page, but for right now, this is fine for like a really simple dashboard. Now on the left side, I want to have keys. On the right side, I'm going to quickly show how much usage and like what your current bill is based off how many requests you made. And that could be the last thing that we do just for right now in this video. All right, so to set this up, I'm going to again add another div down here. And we can either use flex or grid. So we can do grid, grid calls two, and then wrap all of this content. But actually I'm gonna need another div. And this, like this content that we already had is gonna be on the left. with full flex, flex call. Should be fine, should look still the same, except for the button got really long, that's funny. So let me add MR, <laughs> MR auto, so it's not too long anymore. We can also get rid of those BRs, because we can add our own styling now for that. Also this one at the bottom has margin top eight, which is kind of a lot. So instead of that margin, let's get rid of that. Now let's just add a gap on this flex. Now all of the items are going to be equally spaced out by four. That looks pretty good. So we took care of this left side. I think we might still be doing a, a width somewhere. No, I don't think so. So now let's do another div and we'll do the usage. Do the same like width full flex, flex call. I might center this and we can also do gap four. 
we can have basically really similar. Okay, maybe I won't center just to see how this looks. I'll just copy the same H2. Uh, oops. So maybe I'll do H3. Instead of API keys, it'll say like API usage. All right, yeah, that's that's fine. Maybe I'll add some margin though between these elements. So I'm gonna add margin top four. We can also work on the mobile responsiveness in a second because I know this is not gonna be mobile responsive just yet. So now for the API usage, we can do we can just have like the first kind of div, just a little card, kind of like how we did for the other UI pieces. Gonna keep this UI very simple. There's a lot to be improved here. So now we're gonna say API request count. And then we can just print out current user dot API request dot count. As you can see, we have two API requests. We can add some P4. But yeah, that looks not bad. Just for starting off. So this is the usage you have. We did two requests. We can show some other stuff now. So I can just copy that div and let's change out something like uh, AI generations. So to find out the AI generations count, it would just be the API request where AI response is not nil. So it would actually be where dot not AI response nil. And that would be how many times AI has generated content. So it's two times. And then what we could do is just show like, I guess requests in this or requests this month. So how about like, we have to choose how often we charge them. Maybe if we do monthly, we say request this month, we can just do API requests dot where uh, created at dot dot date dot now dot beginning of month that's a method you can do in rails let's see if it works no it's no method now for date so maybe i meant date time dot now or wait i'm confused now maybe it's time dot now okay that that worked but now it says zero Oh wait, the dot dot means before the beginning of the month. So I want to say after the beginning of month till now. So it says two. And then the last thing we might have is like the billing. Uh, usage cost. Where we just take the API request this month out and then multiply that by however much money we charge per API request. Now, obviously, this varies a lot because well, how ChatGPT does it is they tell you how many tokens you made based on how complex your prompt is. And we might want to do something similar, but if we wanted to just start it off with like, obviously, since this is your company, this is your software as a service, you could have whatever business model, whatever pricing plan you want. So if we wanted to be different and just have a set price for every request, let's say 25 cents a request, and it doesn't matter how complex, then we might just have API request price, which could be a constant. And we would set this somewhere. For, so for us, I think, let's set it in an initializer, config initializers. And let's create a new file called business.rb. This could be like all of our business stuff. And I'm gonna set the request price, which would be 25 cents. And a nice thing about doing a constant is we can reference this all around our app and if we ever needed to, let's say, upgrade the price to 30 cents, you could easily do it right here. So now to see this all come together, let's reload. Oh, we get uninitialized constant. Oh, because, because I set this in an initializer, you need to restart the server so it can get the new value. So let's quickly restart the server, reload, and we'll see our usage cost is 0 0.5, which that doesn't really convert to a monetary value, but we can. And the way that we would do that is by doing a number to currency. 
it's gonna look pretty crazy like with all of this stuff happening but you pass number to currency you should probably do some parentheses and obviously we could move these into the controller or like a method on the model or something as you can see usage cost is 50 cents so that actually looks right to me yeah and the more that we go the more that it would cost so let's go ahead and run up this balance <laughs> just ask some more questions so I'm gonna say what's a good idea for a YouTube video see how fast it can generate me a new idea for a YouTube video this feels magical honestly I'm so happy that we were able to create this software as a service we're going to be running Olama. So this is something that I would I would recommend if you're going to have Olama on any of your apps, you might just want to have some sort of software as a service like this for yourself. You can give yourself a free account, of course, where it doesn't cost you anything. And you just host the Olama model. Because hosting Olama models, it requires an expensive virtual machine. So doing it this way, you can have one location for your Olama models, and then you can use the API Authenticate with a token. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I think our request has finished. Sweet. This is what we get back. So we actually got a couple ideas. The first is how-to tutorials. So that's literally what I'm doing right now. That's what I do on my channel is make how-to tutorials, coding tutorials, art tutorials, photography. So basically tutorials is a big thing for ideas. Cool. And then of course, if we go back to our dashboard now, reload, We'll see our usage went up to 75 cents. This is awesome, guys. We built a software as a service. Obviously, now you'd want to integrate Stripe, which is pretty simple. I've done it a lot on my channel. And we could actually add some sort of billing page where you could pay for your billing. And you could also save your credit card information so it could automatically bill you at the end of the billing cycle. That's what most platforms are doing now. So real quickly, before I end the video, let's make sure mobile responsiveness is working by stretching it, resizing it, and yeah, look, it really definitely does not work. So let's fix this right now. To fix it, all we have to do is look around here and make everything responsive. So the first thing is this grid calls. Let's do a medium breakpoint for the grid calls too. So right off the bat, that already fixed this setup. Now we can add some margin for this API usage. Let's do margin top eight. But then medium, we can get rid of the margin. Although actually I think the margin top might actually not that look that bad because it was a little bit off anyways because of the button. But you know what I want to do, yeah, medium. We're not gonna have margin top. You know what I can do to fix the offness is just move this button up on the same line as the H1. Because that would look kind of good. So what, to do that real quick, let's take the link. Actually, all we have to do is wrap this in a div. Div class flex item center justify between just a button between and a width full just as simple as that we could have these on the same line and close off the div reload and boom although the justify between didn't seem to work because <laughs> i think the width full um where's that width full Oh, because we had MR Auto. Let's get rid of that MR Auto on that. And boom, that's a little bit cleaner. Although now these but this button's like right next to API usage. That's not good. So let's do width three fourths and then MX Auto. Or though, maybe not MX Auto. Maybe just width three fourths. Yeah, you know what? That looks pretty good. And then mobile. Oh, we might want to fix that width so it's width full. So let's do medium with three fourths, but on mobile we'll do with full. This looks good. The last thing I'm going to fix is these top links for the endpoint in the example. So to do that, I'm going to go up to this div that has flex, and we're going to do flex call on mobile and then medium flex row. And that should fix the responsiveness. Perfect. I mean that looks good, and then we could even add in like a gap. Eight and then medium gap zero. Add a little bit of space here, and then we could add space for the API keys. The same sort of concept. 
with the margin top A and then a medium margin top zero. And boom. I guess also your dashboard could be centered. X center. Oh, cool. This looks pretty good to me just for a start. And of course, we can come back and we can continue this series. If you guys enjoyed it, please press that like button, subscribe, and let me know any ideas you'd like to see happen on this video or on this app, I should say, and on the series. I'll also publish this code onto my GitHub, and you can find the source code down in the description. So if you want to mess with the code, run this up locally, go ahead. And if you want to deploy it to production, that sounds awesome too. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll see you very soon.